Hi everyone, it's Karen Colesaw here. I have the pleasure of introducing Michael Sade, who is the Director of Health Outcomes and Quality of Care Research and in the Division of Pulmonary Medicine and a core faculty member in the Anderson Center for Health, Health Systems Excellence at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, he applies behavioral and social science to the question, what does it take to make sure the right treatment gets to the right child in the right way at the right time every time? I think more importantly for the talk today, he's a tireless advocate of the um, youth, child, and family voice in research and quality improvement and is himself a parent. So I'm really pleased to welcome you and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Karen, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, the uh, the webinar today was uh, billed as engaging family partners across large networks, but the title that you see on the screen is engagement and co-production in a learning health system. And uh, during the course of the hour, I'll unpack all of those words. Um, as Karen mentioned, uh, I, I am a uh, social and behavioral scientist. Um, I think about the healthcare system as a uh, social system, as a human system, and uh, the basic science behind changing the, the, uh, the health system as uh, behavioral and social science. And um, yeah, I do have three kids, and one of them has uh, a chronic uh, condition. Um, so engagement and co-production in a learning health system, what, is, what does this mean? So first I'm gonna talk about a learning health system uh, and give you an example. Many of you may already know about improved care now, but uh, I'll kind of go into that a little bit. And then I'll talk about what I mean by engagement and what, what do we mean by co-production in a learning health system. Um, I think for most of us, um, the, uh, the, the biggest question for improving care is, is not uh, what to do. There are a lot of treatments that are fairly effective. Um, the, the, real, the real question is how to make sure that the right kid gets the right treatment at the right time every time. And uh, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the biggest <clears throat> challenge I think that we, that we face. If you think about the health system uh, as people interacting with one another and with information and with technology uh, in the context of policy and culture, uh, then you know, the, the biggest uh, question about this how is uh, in, in terms of producing and coordinating the information, knowledge, and know-how for improving. And, and this is sort of the idea behind uh, this notion of a learning health system um, that the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, um, uh, talked about, talks about. And, and a learning healthcare system is you know, one system for learning and for, for doing, not separate systems for research and clinical care, a system where data is generated at the point of care uh, captured and aggregated to become knowledge, which is then applied to clinical care rapidly. So it's an integration of the clinical and research for learning in real time. Part of the question that this begs then is who should be learning? Should we be, should it be experts, expert researchers, expert clinicians, or uh, should it be everyone? Um, and you know this is kind of like the difference between Microsoft and Carta and Wikipedia. Um, I can't see anybody, everybody on the call, so I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember uh, when you, you used to get Microsoft and Carta delivered uh, to to your to your mailbox or your physical mailbox. Uh, so Microsoft, Microsoft and Carta was Microsoft's attempt to develop the world's first online encyclopedia. So they uh, bought Grawlier's encyclopedia, they hired thousands of professional editors and researchers, and they developed Encarta, which uh, you would then subscribe to. And every so often, I think I think it was less often than monthly, um, 
you know, they would mail new CDs to to you, and you would have there a you know uh, an encyclopedia. Wikipedia, you know, had a different idea, and um, it's where they made it possible for everybody to contribute to the accumulation of knowledge and grow it together. Uh, and it, actually, if you um, if you Google Microsoft Encarta, uh, the first entry is the wiki. The, the first Google uh, entry is the Wikipedia entry that says that Microsoft Encarta stopped production in 2009 uh, when they realized that they couldn't compete with a superior product that was available for free. Uh, so this is uh, the notion behind what's called commons-based peer production. Um, Yochai Benkler, who's a legal scholar, uh, wrote a book describing this called The Wealth of Networks. And uh, it's the idea that with the right system, everyone can contribute to the solution. Um, and uh, the, uh, we, we've taken these ideas of commons-based peer production uh, and sort of the, you know the notion behind Wikipedia and other um, other uh, of its sort, and uh, applied that to the healthcare system. Um, uh, so this notion of a collaborative chronic care network is one where we try to make it possible for everybody who is living and working, if you will, in the in the healthcare system um, has an opportunity to uh, to co-produce the information, knowledge, and know-how for improving. Um, an example of this, sort of the flagship example, the prototype of SC3N, our learning network, is Improve Care Now, which is, uh, and this slide is, is uh, is a little bit old. Uh, there are now 109 centers with about 700 gastroenterologists and about um, uh, almost 50,000 uh, IBD patients uh, in the United States and the UK and Belgium uh, to uh, 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 treating kids with pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, um, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. Um, when uh, the network started, it was a group of seven uh, centers, and the percent of patients in their practice in remission was about, you know, 60 percent. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, 12 years later, there are, are uh, as I said, you know, 50,000 patients, and the remission rate is actually at this point above 80 percent. Um, so kind of remarkable uh, change over time. And the question is, you know, how was this result achieved? I think really there are three main elements in understanding uh, how, how this learning health system works. Uh, there's uh, culture, uh, the tools, and this notion of working with families as partners. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of talk through each of them. The culture in Improved Care Now has been intentionally developed. Um, there's a sense of all teach, all learn. The, uh, the mantra is sh steal shamelessly and share seamlessly. And the reason for that is that there is, we, we, we very intentionally um, uh, created a shared goal of uh, percent of patients in remission across the network. So uh, while we may have, um, oops, while we, oops, sorry, while we may have, uh, uh, care centers here in Cincinnati and one in Columbus down the road. And while Cincinnati Children's and Nationwide Children's in Columbus might might have some sort of competition, 
uh, there is no competition between uh, the clinic, uh, the IBD clinic in Cincinnati and the IBD clinic at Nationwide. In fact, uh, we want the other to succeed. So, because that will increase the remission rate for the kids that we all take care of. And so this, this notion of steal shamelessly and share seamlessly is that if, if I have a good idea, I want you to have it. And if, if, if I have a good idea, I expect you uh, to, to, to take it. Um, and you, know, you can read these words to describe us, which was from a, a survey in the community. Um, there is actually a lot of um, evidence, social science, um, evolutionary biology, uh, economics, and um, and uh, others that suggest that um, at base, most humans are motivated to be cooperative and and pro-social. Uh, and if in the uh, insight that we had was that uh, rather than getting people to do stuff, if you could arrange the system so that it was easier for people to express their inherent motivation, uh, they they would do the things that they wanted to do uh, voluntarily. Um, so the uh, uh, so um, another. Uh, Part of the uh, another part of the uh, of the of the equation, if you will, is tools to make the work easier. So um, we start we put together a uh, what we call an enhanced registry that makes it easier to do data entry, data uh, data in once. Um, so data is collected as part of clinical care. Uh, we've we've used that data then to create automated clinical tools, pre-visit planning tools, and population management tools. Um, and because the data is used for clinical care, people care about it, the physicians and, and uh, other clinicians and people working in the clinics uh, are uh, you know, invested in making that uh, good quality data. Um, and uh, you can see from that the uh, Clinicians are actually using these automated reports. Um, the, the other uh, type of tools is, to, is um, making sharing easier. So, uh, if we're if we are trying to share seamlessly, how can we make that easy to do? Well, one way is to um, is to have uh, sort of a uh, online sharing platform we've created one called the exchange that is sort of loosely based on pinterest where you can you know take uh videos or uh, documents or um, presentations or other tools um, that you're using in your clinic and post them online and people can uh, pin those and repin them and remix them and use them themselves you can see some other ways of doing that as well, of sharing. Um, this is just an annotated run chart, um, you know, showing the increase in the rate of uh, in the rate of sharing um, on the on these on the exchange. Um, a third uh, part of this equation is this notion of working with or co-production. We'll talk now about that. Um, it, it is it is not the case, although we talk about healthcare consumers and healthcare providers, that health is something that can be given uh, to uh, um, people uh, from, you know, from experts, uh, it's not like buying a toaster. Right? I don't, I can't go to the store, give you twenty dollars, and get health. It's actually shared work, and this notion of co-production uh, has actually quite a long history in in economics and and um, political economy. The notion that services are produced by the interaction between 
um, uh, providers of the service and the users of the service. Um, so we, we kind of are thinking about, you know, a healthcare delivery system when, and, and this notion of a, you know, a factory, when in fact, it's much more like um, a, uh, it's, it's much more like a class, a classroom or an educational system where you, you have to actually have to have um, the participation of both the teacher and the student in order for learning uh, to, to take place. So this is a shift uh, in working uh, from a shift from working for families as customers to working with families as partners. And uh, if you have a learning health system and uh, you have the the notion that you know you can use that uh, to that you can use that infrastructure to work with families, um, then engagement is actually being part of that distributed learning health system to produce the information, knowledge, and know-how for improving both the healthcare system and personal health. A lot of times we people talk about engagement and really what they mean is getting people to do what we want them to do. Um, and, and that's because there isn't really a system that's well suited to enabling people to work together in order to, you know, achieve a mutual goal. But uh, this way of thinking about engagement in um, a learning health system is is slightly different. Um, we think about uh, engagement as having several different levels. Um, you first have to know that a learning health system exists. And there are many people who come to the clinic here at Cincinnati Children's who know that they get their employment here, their IBD care or their autism care at, um, at uh, Cincinnati Children's, but they're not necessarily aware that, uh, you know, Cincinnati Children's is part of, in, in the case of IBD, improved care now, nor what that would mean for their role as a patient or a uh, parent and, um, and uh, you know, what it means for their care. Uh, once people are aware, some percent of them uh, will participate, use the tools that already exist. Uh, in, in, in this, in the case of the healthcare system, unfortunately, there aren't that many tools that are, that are um, available for people to participate in. They can show up for their appointment, you can learn about your condition online. You can track your symptoms. You can, but you know, you can sign up for research studies. Um, you know, but if you have a really good idea, um, and you want to change the healthcare system, like where do you go, uh, or what do you do? So, um, the, so that's you know, so that's participation. But then the the next level is improving the tools or contributing. So. Um, uh, you know, a, a participant might read a blog, and a, and a and a contributor might post on that blog or on the on the exchange, for example. And then you have the owners who are sort of the um, you know very small one percent of, of of people who are who are creating tools, leading teams, organizing events, running projects, creating new tools. And the idea is that if there are uh, more tools, more local capacity, more local action, more capacity, and more innovation, then we'll actually have more participation uh, when, you know, by engaging the contributors and the owners to build more tools makes it easier for more people to participate. So let me give you some examples of this. Um, here is uh, one of our patients, Jill, you can see her on the bottom in the hospital, and um, uh, here she is above. She actually has graduated from grad school now and uh, is a um, health psychologist. Um, why does she participate? Um, she doesn't, she, there's a lot of uh, reasons, but bottom line here is she doesn't want other young people with IBD to feel as if their care is beyond their control. So she is one of these owners, right? And and the again the uh, 
the the insight here is that there are a lot of people like Jill who have a lot to give, who want to uh, you know who, who want to contribute to the community, and if you arrange things correctly, they will actually be able to express that. So uh, Jill was the first, uh, the founding member of, of what's called the Improved Care Now PAC, the Patient Advisory Council. Uh, these three young young ladies are uh, the sort of next generation. Actually, and actually, they uh, this is Sammy. She's a third year medical student, and um, Jenny is um, finishing her PhD in psychology. Um, yeah, so they've uh, and and uh, Jenny's actually published uh, some work in um, the New England Journal. So she's she's one up on me in New England Journal of Medicine articles. But uh, they'll both tell you that they didn't start out as leaders. They uh, they became leaders because they were interacting with a system that um, you know that develops leaders that uh, takes people who are motivated and gives them ways to continue to participate. Um, so, you know, so there, it, so, it's a, so in, in addition to developing leaders, you can get some quite remarkable uh, contributions. So this is Zach, and I couldn't get the, um, the film to run, but basically um, he, uh, he and his dad made a video uh, showing how to insert his nasogastric tube. Now, the the frontline um, um, treatment for Crohn's in uh, Europe is enteral nutrition, and uh, it, it frontline treatment for Crohn's here in the states is um, is uh, medicine. Uh, part of the reason why uh, enteral nutrition hasn't caught on in the United States is that it's believed that you know well how can how can kids be expected to drop their own nasogastric tube every day? Well, um, here's Zach and he you know goes through this process and he shows you know how I do this. Um, it's fun to show this video to uh, a group of doctors because all of them start gagging. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, how powerful is it, uh, you know, just to have this posted online so that anybody who is interested and, and is struggling with this can actually learn uh, from, from, you know, somebody in a similar situation. Um, we were um, uh, very uh, uh, excited when, when parents started coming in large quantities to um, to the community conferences uh, for improved care now, and the community conferences are twice uh, twice yearly um, uh, conferences where the whole uh, network gets together to share. Uh, and it was it was really amazing. The, the parents were telling stories, and the people were very inspired. and And after a year or two of that, um, the parents came to us and said, "You know." It's very nice that you are interested in our stories. It's very nice that you're motivated. Um, but we should also tell you what other skills we have. And they made this list for us. Um, and we didn't even actually know to ask about this. But you can see, hmm, there's some really useful uh, expertise here uh, beyond the thousands of hours uh, of of direct hands-on care uh, and experience that they have. Um, so at this point, you know, parents uh, are part of the team. They organize and they teach at the community conferences, the learning sessions. They create tools um, like this booklet over here um, uh, for parents. And they, 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 they create these tools and they solve problems before we even know uh, that we have uh, a, a problem. They, they, make, they create solutions before we even know that we have a problem. Um, and here's you know, another example, um, the parent handbook. And it's uh, developed by um, the 
the parent at Riley Children's Hospital, and uh, she posted it to the exchange so that other parents um, can uh, can can benefit as well. Uh, just in the last couple months, um, you know, we've had uh, these kinds of contributions uh, from all over. Um, and and again, it's 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 remarkable because people will come and they will present you solutions to problems you didn't even know you had. Um, and and what's interesting is that you know no one asks anyone to make these contributions, um, but they they did, and and that and that's remarkable in, in itself. But um, then we started getting thank you cards from the people who were giving these contributions to the network. Um, you know, these thank you cards would say things like, you know, thank you for believing in us and giving us the opportunity to work with you. It was amazing to craft my own scope of work and run with it. Um, and uh, this last one, right, I ICN has changed my life more than in inflammatory bowel disease. Isn't that an amazing thing? Um, so this is, this. we were actually quite surprised um, by the intensity of this. Uh, and another example of this is, here's Peter uh, Margolis, who's one of the co-leads of Improved Care Now. Um, he's posing with the team that created the exchange. Um, they, uh, this is Dan McClendon who led the team. Dan had this idea. Uh, he uh, bought a, a, a site and funded it from his own money, grabbed some volunteers in his division and built this, this um, the exchange for Improved Care Now. And uh, Peter, you, know, you can see, is wearing a T-shirt that the team bought as gifts for us. Uh, for they they gave us gifts uh, for for allowing them to be you know part of this bigger uh, this bigger thing. So this is what I'm. Uh, so when when we talk about uh, uh, engagement uh, and co-production in a learning health system. Uh, this is what we're talking about is if you have the right uh, the right system and you have um, shared goals, a culture of sharing opportunities for people to participate and contribute, um, they will uh, and and uh, they will engage in uh, common space peer production. Um, and and uh, you know to to generate the information, the knowledge, and know-how for improving. So before I um, but before I stop, I want to show you another story. This one is from uh, cystic fibrosis, and it's uh, a sort of a, a series of, of tweets. So uh, here's Aaron. Uh, Aaron at the time had a kid who was three years old uh, with cystic fibrosis. And one of the big fears for CF is um, uh, infection with some of these nasty uh, microbes that can really devastate uh, their lung capacity. Um, kids with CF are not supposed to get within about, you know, within the same room as one another and for fear of cross infection, but you know they're also meant to come to clinic, um, uh, you know, three or four times a year. Where who is there but other kids with CF? So she's worried, um, and uh, she's growing increasingly anxious. Right. My gut instinct is to get out of here. So many people, some with masks, some without. I don't know who has CF and who doesn't. I assume all do. And she's posting this on Twitter, uh, sort of as a cry for help. Um, and she's serious about this. There's got to be a better way. Um, someone 
from literally from the other side of the world has a suggestion. So this is Jared from Australia. Doctors in Australia have started to, teleco to teleconferencing where the patient has an accepted spirometer. Huh. She says, can you send me more information? Are you aware of any papers or anything like that? In fact, yeah, here you go. Uh, I just mailed you the article. I sometimes even teleconference with my doctor uh, here in Spain. And not only that, but here's a video of a demonstration in Australia of remote tele, you know, telemonitoring uh, using uh, spirometry. Uh, Aaron rebroadcasts this for more health. This is amazing. Can we get this for CF here in the US? I don't want to have to wait 10 years or even two years. Uh, let's make it happen. And she leverages uh, her uh, network, in this case, the strong ties that she has with me, and says, uh, you know, the fact that this exists and we aren't utilizing it makes me crazy. This is exactly what I want. How do I get it? To, um, to the to the division chief, she's a little bit more um, uh, polite. I understand and appreciate the value of patients being seen by their doctor quarterly, but can we actually do this? Imagine, you know, I could, if I could imagine my perfect scenario for CF care management, this would be it. And I broker this to other parts of the network and say to some of the other CF clinicians, hey, this is a pretty heavy list, lift, but could we do this? This is kind of amazing. Um, and the network is activated. Shelly says, uh, we are actually using this telemedicine through Epic. It's a built-in fe feature, and here's the new con uh, telemedicine division. There are a few kinks, but we can work that through. Um, the CF cl clinicians say, yeah, this is all very nice, but a uh, uh, little, uh, little bit pie in the sky. Um, and I kind of push back. Yeah, that's a problem, but, um, but how about if we start to get some examples and people start rallying? Yeah, that would be great. This would be great. Let's do this. In the meantime, um, and, and then they start pitching solutions. They've, they've, they've started now to think, um, why not pilot this? Uh, let's er do some early prototyping. Hey, I have a family with CF who's um, like, who could actually, do this and uh, somebody else said yeah you know somebody talked to well, mom talked to me about this after the clinic visit and she's happy to try something in the meantime the division chief uh, brokers this idea to the uh, hospital leadership dear all please see this communication uh, and um, you know with with the current challenges best in class is a bold concept that requires bold solutions uh, where we want to do this and the uh, senior leader, uh, the department chair writes back, I agree, we should do this. And here's some, uh, here's some, ex here's some resources. Upshot, two clinician patient pairs ready to prototype, senior leadership buy-in connected with existing resource. That whole thing took two days. So when you have everybody working together, uh, there's a, you can actually uh, make some huge advances. Um, so that is uh, the whole story. And I can uh, stop and take questions for our discussion. This is Karen. Um, oh, nope. Yeah, well, thanks so much. It was super interesting. I wonder if you could, if you were sort of to say what might be the top three things that you'd suggest other networks do, um, what you might suggest. I think the top three things are probably um, Think about the system as being, uh, think about how to make the system useful for everybody. Um, there's a tendency to say, you know, let's design this for patients, let's design this for clinicians, let's design this for, uh, you know, for research. 
but understanding that everybody, you know, patients and clinicians and researchers are actually all part of a bigger class of beings called humans, um, and understanding that, um, you know, that people want to uh, collaborate, um, you know, figure out how to make it easier for that to happen. So, um, and and you know what one of the one of the key things with that is you know having a common goal um you know and and that's surprisingly difficult i, I know that um uh you know that every, you know it, it always starts with yeah we want better health but exactly what does that mean and how do we get there and 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 um i know that the uh, autism uh, an autism learning health network is working on a couple of you know main outcome measures, including I think uh, health related quality of life. Um, but you know, so you need that motivation, uh, that shared goal, and then I think to the degree that you can um, uh, Im imagine that uh, there is comparative expertise. Uh, that resides in and among everybody. So everybody is an expert in something, um, and 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 that solving problems together is a matter of assembling that expertise in in new ways. So that you know, as a clinician, you're you're certainly an expert in the clinical uh, treatment of autism. But as a parent, um, parents are certainly experts in the life experience of living with somebody with autism or being or a patient being somebody um, who has autism and it's the interaction between those that that make a difference um, so that's two um, uh, the third is I think um, to be willing to learn together and have a system for learning. And yeah, I mentioned, uh, you know, um, uh, tools for sharing, but I didn't mention that quality improvement, or QI, is a um, not only it, it, it it's a, a, a QI is a way that we can all um, sort of have a shared understanding of how how to tackle problems, how we're going to learn together, what we you know how we make decisions, and so having um, having a way to learn together, I think, is important as well. Thank you. In other words, what you guys are doing. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Michael. That was a great presentation and great. Um, three answers that you gave. Um, so I have a couple of questions from the audience that people um, have sent me. Uh, the first one is, um, they say, I love the idea of co-production and I believe the Autism Treatment Network implements this in a very meaningful and effective way. How can we improve the knowledge and awareness of the Learning Health Network and provide access to our families? I would think that probably there's others on the call that could actually do a better job answering that than I could. Okay. Um, well, how maybe not specifically <laughs> to our um, to the Autism Learning Health Network, but how mm. would you say um, is the best way to get a range of families um, involved in, in a learning health network? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it, it 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 it's not straightforward, and I think it's um, it's a matter of sort of incrementally growing. Um, you know, I, I think there's sometimes a tendency to say, uh, "Hey, everybody, let's sign up and do this," and and then you get a lot of people excited and signed up, and now you have a list of people, um, but not a lot of things for them to do. And not sort of disappointing for everybody. Um, so we've been trying to both build the system that allows people to do stuff and the knowledge 
or awareness that that system exists sort of at the same time. So when we have, uh, you know, when, so we, you know, uh, start maybe with, you know, something that's not, um, um, you know, widespread. Um, one example is, you know, having people who, you know, patients and families partnering with the clinical team at the care center to do QI. Um, and, you know, so that's one, it, that's not, you know, necessarily something that everybody wants to do, not, every, not something, necessarily something that everybody can do. And in yeah. fact, probably it's going to be somebody who's sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, somebody who's um, you know, along the uh, um, where is it? You know the 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 right hand part of this uh, engagement um, spectrum, right? Contributor owner, um, but um, if we do, if we if we our theory. And, and so far, it seems to be working out. Is that if we can um, identify uh, some owners and contributors, and they can um, help to uh, build some more tools, then um, we can kind of broadcast more about those tools, so that it gives people more of an opportunity to participate. So at this point, for example. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, you know, this um, parent handbook. There are now about a dozen toolkits that have been produced by the parent working group and the pack. They're on our website, and now, and we also have, you know, several thousand uh, folks um, signed up to receive updates when new stuff comes out, and so. Uh, you know, so then people can download the toolkits and you know participate in in that way. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, that's sort of the idea that it's a it's an iterative process. Yeah, I think that you did a great job at answering that. That at least helped me. I um, hope it helped other people as well. Um, one other question that we have that is kind of um, in terms of helping a self-advocate. Um, so as a child ages and starts to be more um, held accountable for their own health instead of making decisions for their own health instead of um, relying on their parent, how would you, um, and are there any differences of going about approaching engaging a self-advocate versus, or a patient themselves versus a parent? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so we, um, I'll, I'll talk about the, the um, Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network for a minute, just because um, in CF there are actually now more adults with cystic fibrosis and there are kids with cystic fibrosis. And the CF Learning Network has uh, adult care centers as well as pediatric care centers involved. Um, so CF is different from autism, of course, but um, we, are actually, we are seeing uh, differences um, in, across adult and peds. Um, one set of differences has to do with the relative resources in pediatric centers versus adult centers. Um, a lot of times when uh, pediatric patients sort of transition from the children's hospital to the local adult hospital, it's a, it's a pretty rude shock. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that's sort of one issue to, to consider. Another difference that we see is um, uh, you know, so sort of the capacity of parents who are uh, not chronically ill, you know, don't have CF, for example, versus uh, to to advocate 
um, the energy that that takes versus somebody who is an adult with cystic fibrosis. And um, a lot of these guys are really sick. Uh, so it's hard for them to maintain the, uh, the, the involvement and, uh, you know, come to the meetings and, and show up, et cetera. Um, and, uh, the other thing is, um, uh, and, and, you know, this is sort of universal. I think, you know, parents will do stuff for their kids that they won't do for themselves. Uh, and adults, you know, will, will say, well, I am not really, you know, I don't maybe deserve that or whatever. Um, parents will fight hard for their kids, um, uh, harder perhaps than uh, people will fight for themselves. Um, all of that to say, all of that though, um, I think are probably, you know, differences in in uh, degree, not necessarily in differences in kind. I think that the um, the similarities, you know, are, are are probably greater than the differences. In that, uh, we have adult patients in the CF Learning Network who are um, fierce advocates for themselves and for others, who have tons of energy, even when they're really really sick. Uh, to to keep going, who have uh, amazing expertise, um, uh, you know, both in the lived experience and from their professional uh, lives. Um, so um, I think you know, there's uh, there are differences, but probably the fundamentals are the same. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, so I think we have time for one final question um, that I have been wondering since you mentioned that um, a lot of times when you have patients or parents of patients um, joining that they provide answers to questions that you didn't even know to ask. Um, mm -hmm. How do you go about resolving that? So when you've got that list, how do you know mm -hmm. where to start if you haven't even um, been thinking or having the resources dedicated mm -hmm. to making those changes? Um, well, yeah, so actually these are, these are, um, things that have been done. Um, so for example, the Levine Children's Hospital, they just made a pre-visit planning video and, uh, posted it. Um, you know, Children's Hospital of King's Daughters, uh, described a group visit model and, and how to do it and, um, showed how it works. And, uh, so um it, in in a, in a way um what we've done is sort of distribute the production of all of the of all of these solutions um so uh you know it, it it's less a matter of trying to organize and keep people in line and more of a matter of trying to um you know curate and connect and um Keep people connected and and, um, and excited, and making it possible for them to get the resources that they need to do the stuff that they want to do. Um, uh, does that? It, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Yeah, I yeah. think that that does really answer the question. Um, so I know that we want to be cognizant of time for people. So Michael, do you have any final words that you would like? Um, to share any pieces of advice, perhaps, for our network? Um, uh, I, you know, I think uh, one of the things that, um, that I've learned is that um, there's, um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, I guess there's a, it's a sort of the flip side. Um, so I think that at, I think when when we're in a, uh, the healthcare system, uh, you know, there's 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 been a lot of research showing how the healthcare system um, 
uh, you know, uh, creates more errors than are necessary. And you know, there's there's well, lots of outcomes that could could have been avoided. All this kind of stuff that suggests that the healthcare system can actually be toxic to patients. But one of the things that we're also starting to realize, and this is reflected in things like physician burnout and suicide, um, is that the healthcare system is is toxic as well to clinicians and others who work in it. Um, most doctors didn't go to med school because their, you know, their greatest wish growing up was to um, to chart online and and drop charges. Um, they they actually want to help. They want to make a difference. They want to connect with people, and um, uh, it, we just don't have a system that uh, that allows that expression uh, to to be realized. Um, but I've it's been remarkable to me to um, to work with both clinicians and patients in these networks and have them. You know, just casually remark as an aside. You know, since I since I started thinking about working with my patients, my whole day is better. I'm just having a whole lot more fun. Or, you know, um, you know, this is the, the kind of uh, you know, I think that um, at base, and people kind of freak out sometimes when I say this, but but I mean it in 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 sort of the the, the broadest sense. There's a lot of love that is locked up uh and people love their doctors people love their patients but they they often don't have the opportunity in the seven minutes that they have in in clinic or whatever uh to express that to actually you know connect and and to uh, see one another as human and, and express that love and um so um figuring out how to do that and make the system uh, something that's in in which it's possible to express that is, you know, I think one of the things that is very powerful in, in this work. Yeah, thank you so much for that advice and for your wonderful presentation. Um, a reminder to all that this video will be saved and uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you know of other people who would benefit from seeing this, you can uh, send them that link. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. I hope that everybody has a great rest of their Thursday and a wonderful weekend. Thanks very much.